perceived financial stability growing up affect consumption patterns? A presentation brought to you by this guy and that guy. So, indisputably, every person on earth has a unique relationship with money based on a complex tapestry of past experiences that lead them to specific spending behaviors. In our study, we wanted to put this concept under the microscope by asking what about those past experiences causes people to form certain spending habits and not others? Uh, how can we group or characterize people in order to predict the way that they'll spend? What else do people who go or who all shop at Target for the low prices, for example, have in common with each other? So we wanted to look at the idea that one subjective perceived place on the socioeconomic pyramid and financial stability growing up might have a direct correlation with one's spending patterns. It seems probable that somebody who grew up feeling like money was never an issue would be more free in their spending, while those who always saw money as an obstacle would be more stingy in their consumption and buy cheaper products and be less concerned with other characteristics. So um, our topic is pretty broad, and we weren't really sure what kind of questions to include and what kind of questions we were going to use. So we ended up having about 32 questions on our survey, I think, because we wanted to keep a really open mind, and then we ended up taking questions away at the end that we didn't use in our analysis. If you can't read it, it says the good news is profits are up 74%, the bad news is we don't know why. So we ended up finding that there is not that much correlation between perceived financial stability and consumption patterns after all. And what correlations there were turned out to be counter to our original hypothesis. But uh, more on that in a few minutes. So we found that this lack of correlation uh, to be in line with other similar research we were doing in our lit review. The idea of socioeconomic class correlating with spending habits is being tested all over the place and continues to show that there is a, no simple relationship between spending patterns and financial stability. Essentially, our research just told us that previous experiments found a lack in correlation. The answer to these questions about why people consume the way they do is much more complicated and convoluted than that, and behavioral economics is only at the tip of the iceberg in affecting the significance of these different variables. So our actual survey, we conducted it at Pritzker College mostly on students and it was just in the dining halls during dinner and lunch except for you guys who took the survey here and a couple people at the computer lab we got. So our survey was divided into three sections. First section was consumption questions talking about how people spend their money. Second section was just general demographics about age, education, um, whatnot. Um, and the third section was about your finances growing up. We asked like all kinds of questions, some that were really straightforward, um, and some that were a little more complicated, like or that we weren't sure what the results were going to be, like did you go shopping as a pastime, that kind of thing. And one problem that we can run into with surveys when you're asking people to take it is if a lot of people say no, just like when they have to do teacher evaluations here, when they like send out the big ones to you in your email, and they keep coming back to you if you don't do it, because if they only accept the people who want to do the survey, then that's not a random sample. Um, but we were lucky in that almost nobody said they don't want to take our survey, so I think we had a pretty random sample of people in the dining hall. Um, and we only had about um, 96 um, surveys taken, but um, we think that was enough, like given our time constraint, and we split it up into two groups, so it was about 50 people per group, which still um, a lot of us had pretty significant results. Our survey was basically broken down into independent variables about people's perceived financial stability and dependent variable questions. These questions were designed to cover a broad spectrum of consumer choices, uh, from people's choices regarding how price and environment, the consciousness, uh, ethicality, branding, and style affected people's consumption choices. We organized the survey asking consumer preferences first, um, and then demographic information, and then finally about their financial stability growing up. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, so that we would avoid uh, people being swayed to you know, feel like they were talking about their financial security and then answer questions about how they spend. Um, we wanted to get the purest answers uh, of the consumer preferences about what they actually do, hoping that uh, it would not be distracted by or lead to different answers by bringing up family or past experiences. So like I said, we really included lots of questions about their financial status from like, I felt financially stable growing up and my socioeconomic class growing up was blank, but then we also had a lot like, 
I would go shopping for fun as a pastime, and I would go shopping for fun as a pastime ended up having about zero correlation with any of our other financial variables, and we weren't sure like what that was going to be, so we ended up having to drop a lot. Finally, about uh, the general information questions we asked were also independent variables. We asked about gender, education, occupation, and age. This information was designed to distinguish between different demographics. However, most of our subjects were students from the college and with many similarities in their general information and demographic information, and it turned out to be a fairly moot point by the end of our data collection of just 96 surveys. Our goal was to isolate the two main groups of people based on their independent variables, people who felt financially secure growing up and people who were not. Um, we looked at the correlations between our independent variable questions and let the data tell us where to make the split. Uh, then we could look at our dependent variables and see where the data revealed anything useful or interesting about the different ways people spent their money. So on to our data. Okay. So like Zach just said, we had to split the group up into two different groups. And um, we did a composite. We chose two of the questions that were the most simple because like, we ended up including lots of financial questions that were really confusing and didn't correlate. We used the two most simple questions that made an average composite score for people scored one through five. And then we saw 24% uh, of people scored uh, a 3.5 or below, so that's where we decided to make the split to make it about 50-50. If we'd gone higher, it would have been like 60%. So that's how we decided where to split our data into the unstable group and the stable group. So here we see the consumption choices between all participants, positive financial score, and consumption questions. A correlation close to 1 or negative 1 would mean that there's a high correlation, and a value closer to 0 means that there's less correlation. And as you can see here, question 9, highlighted in green, was our highest correlation value at negative 0.2, which is still extremely low. So in other words, there is not very much statistically interesting information revealed simply by looking at correlations between how financially secure you felt growing up and how you responded to our consumption questions. Uh, so we went on to do two tests to see how much the uh, groups overlapped. So these are the two tests, and we went with a 5% alpha. And as you can see, there's only these three that are highlighted were significant. So we kind of, at this point, disregarded the other questions, even though there might be some more interesting information if we really like looked at the data specifically. But uh, we went on to further analyze these three questions. So this one, if you read, that means you don't like to shop at Walmart. And as you can see, the unstable group tended to agree with this more, and the stable group tended to disagree, which is actually the complete opposite of our hypothesis. We thought if you have more money, you won't shop at Walmart because you'll think it's not worth it. But on average, the stable group was almost like a full, a full grade below um, the other group. So this one, completely opposite of ours. And we should clarify too, um, it's not just that they don't like to shop at Walmart, period. The question is worded specifically, I don't like to shop at Walmart because I'm aware of their unethical business practices. So it was really tapping into the decisions behind their choices. Um, so this next question here asks the subject whether uh, they prefer to buy food that they know is grown locally and sustainably. Uh, while it's kind of hard to tell from this graph, the stable group tended to answer three, the big um, yellow middle chunk, while unstable group's highest was four, meaning that they kind of agree. The averages shown below uh, show that the unstable group does, in fact, agree with this statement more than the stable group. So people who are less likely to be feeling financially stable in their growing up are more likely to agree that they would buy locally made products. So this one, similarly, is the last of those significant questions. This is like, if you care more about how your food looks or how your food is grown, and the stable group, once again, cared less about how their food is grown and care more about how it looks, on the unstable group, although this graph is less obvious. Um, here are the averages, so you can see that stable was once again about 0.7 below um, the unstable group. So, you know, we didn't do any regressions on this, and that was because of the way we um, structured our project. When you do a regression, you want one independent variable and a bunch of dependent variables, whereas we structured this for one independent variable, which was your finances, and a bunch of dependent right. variables, which were all the different consumption choices. So regression wouldn't have really given us any good information, especially because our demographic information was so limited. Yeah. So, what lessons can you take away from our study? Um, from our t-test analysis, as discussed earlier, we were able to basically extract essentially that people who say that they grew up feeling less financially secure are more likely to not shop at Walmart because of their unethical practices 
They are more likely to buy local, and they are more likely to care more about how our food is grown than how it looks. It's kind of the opposite of what we expected to find in our hypothesis, which was that people who had more money would be more free in how they spend it. There are two arguments or claims that we constructed based on this data. The first is that maybe people are compensating for feeling lower class and not having the ability to make conscious consumption choices by answering the opposite of what is actually true in our survey. Essentially, to be swayed by ego bias and to say that they care about locally grown food and sustainable practices because in real life they just have to buy what's cheapest. The other argument that we could make is a bit more hopeful. Um, and it's that people who have had to think about money more as an obstacle growing up see themselves as lower class and thereby to form a different relationship with their money and spend it more responsibly than those who grew up feeling stable. In other words, maybe people with money see money as the most important thing, while people without money tend to see money as less important, leading them to conclude that money is a means to an end, but not the end itself, and care more about the impact of their consumption. This would make sense in a world where those who are in lower classes cry out to have locally made food and ethical business practices, while those in the upper classes seem to think about just making money regardless of social, environmental, or natural costs. It's cool that we got these significant results, but it was only three out of our like 17 um, questions about consumption. So we have to consider that most people here, like we saw in the, the first graph, most people said there were a four on the scale of one through five for financial stability, so we don't really have many lower class people. And the, the general lack of correlation did agree with our lit review, which mostly said there was no obvious correlation. And the, the significant results could just be a fluke of this survey. So for further work, we think we should have a bigger sample size next time. We shouldn't focus on the phrasing of some of the questions, because some of them are really ambiguous. And we gave it everyone the same survey, and we could have switched around or given some people different consumption questions so that we could get a better sense of without framing what their actual spending habits are like. So, question. Um, you were first. All right. Um, so we, we actually talked to you look at this in our study a little bit about how the fact that <coughs> the majority of people in the uh, believe that they're like in the middle class. So when you're looking at people and they said they, they have just be like something like four, do you think that had anything to do with um, their um, responses that there might be people that were below class and they just like assume that they were up higher? Well, that's totally possible, but I think what explains it more for me is the fact that we're at Pitzer College. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Right obviously. Like, yeah. that has a big... No, that, yeah, but you're right, that totally could have said it as well. We were, um, we were talking to Professor Nadler a lot about whether we should have an objective, um, objective kind of variable, like, we're thinking of doing whether or not you're on financial aid, but like someone else mentioned in their presentation, it's also, you don't know how much financial aid people are on. And, that was us. Yeah, so, um, and we, so we decided to go with purely subjective, um, like we wanted to measure how the perception of your financial stability affects your consumption, not your actual finances. Right. So. Do you think it's possible um, that people who grew up less financially stable um, are like more, because I, I see like the ethical thing is aside from like money responsibility, that they actually just maybe like empathize a little bit more with like the like underdog, like in terms of like the local producer who's got maybe like one stand or like, Certainly. you know, the Walmart who um, yeah. like uses slave labor, like eating pens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I agree, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have questions? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Do you think if like you were outside the colleges and you maybe went to an affluent neighborhood or neighborhood, I feel like you guys would have had a lot more useful data. Yeah, totally. that's what I was saying. For this research, we need a much bigger yeah. sample without like a yeah. 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 yeah, we our actual not necessarily intention, but one thing we were thinking we do with this survey is bring it out to the Occupy uh, mm -hmm. camp. And then they got evicted the day after we got our survey approved. So <laughs> you yeah, did not get to do that. But that would have been really interesting to have it done. And we would have. Is it Claremont still going? So I had a question about one of your. Yeah. <laughs> There's like 15 um, people. Did you have equal numbers of like stable and unstable people? We had, um, I think it was like. When we made exactly we made the split at 3.5. 40, 42 percent of the people were unstable, so or 43 percent, so 57 were stable. Yeah, it wasn't an exact split, and the split was at 3.5. So the, if you were the unstable group, still included people who were like in the sometimes to still kind of affluent. So we basically the break was like 
if you felt like you were middle class or upper middle class, you might have still fallen into the lower yeah. category. Because yeah. in one of your graphs, it seemed like they're more than, like more stable than unstable, and like it seemed like they're more of one group than there actually was. The yeah. Population. Yeah. Unstable really doesn't mean a whole lot in this particular it's survey. Like more unstable and more sure. stable. Not yeah. Not like actually. Yeah, I've also yeah. found, I don't know so much like it, my friend McKenna and Pomona, but um, especially if kids, are, kids seem to be more sensitive if they are like a lot more affluent than other people here. They tend not to like want it and show it up. Yeah. So that might have. Yeah. Yeah. People's results. Hippies with BMWs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 it's a hybrid. Anyone else? <laughs>